Okay, thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, we do farm in uh, the south central part of Nebraska. We're right in the middle of the United States, so if you could put a, a pin right in the middle of the continental United States, we're about 40 miles straight north of there, so that's where we are at. Uh, just a little bit of background, uh, I taught high school ag and technology for 10 years before moving back to the farm in 1998. Uh, my brother and I uh, have been, uh, well we grew up on this family farm, we've been no-tilling there for 25 years. Uh, we're two-thirds dry land, about a third irrigated, most of that is under pivot irrigation. Traditionally we've been a corn, uh, soybean, cereal rotation. Uh, but we are diversifying that some, and I'll talk a lot more about that here, but we're growing vetch and sunflowers and buckwheat and all kinds of weird stuff now. Uh, about 25, 26 inches annual precipitation. Uh, historical average, you know, some years that's, you know, 38 and some years it's 15, uh, just as, as everybody, you know, goes through those things. We've been using cover crops for about seven years now. And uh, we started the green cover seed, cover crop seed business in 2009 as a response to the demand for cover crop seed and the difficulty in finding it. And since starting that in the last five years, uh, it's really grown uh, as the cover crop industry has. So just last year alone, we served over 1,200 customers in more than 40 states and, and covered about 350,000 acres. Uh, we've mixed over 15 million pounds of cover crop seed, and the most of this has been in diverse mixes. And when we talk about diverse mixes, that's going to be more than four species. And we've got some crazy guys that we work with, like Gabe Brown and some of those guys, and they want 10, 12, 15, 20 different species of cover crops mixed together. And I'll get into a little bit more about why that has been so successful. And one of the things that we do as a business is we, every mix that we do is custom made for the customer. We don't have standardized mixes because we really don't believe that there's a one size fits all when it comes to that. So as I was tasked with this topic of uh, preparing for success in a changing climate, uh, you know, as I was thinking about that, you know, we, we all, all have uh, been dealing with more climate extremes. You know, precipitation events are less frequent and oftentimes more intense. And so, you know, the, the way that we try to prepare for that is we want to build resilience into our cropping systems. And that's a word that we talk about a lot. Uh, we want to build resilience. How can we make our cropping systems and particularly our soil is resilient so it can withstand wet periods, it can withstand dry periods, it can withstand uh, you know whatever comes at us and and, and we really feel like the, the the answer to that is we need to build the health of our soil because when we have healthy soils we're gonna have very resilient systems and and I could talk for half of the day about how we build healthy soils but I want to focus mainly on one one particular thing in the time that I have here and that's through diversity, because we've lost so much diversity in our cropping systems. And there's such great power in diversity, because when we look at these natural systems, when we look at how God created plants to grow in these ecosystems, it's always diverse. You know, there's no such thing as a monoculture in nature. And so when we look at diverse native ecosystems, we want to try to copy that as closely as we can in our cash cropping systems and, and still have the benefit of being able to do cash crops. So one of the things that we look at is using cover crops we can bring a lot of diversity back into our farming systems without necessarily having to grow you know 10 12 14 different cash crops because that gets very difficult now Dwayne Beck he's one of the top uh, uh, agricultural minds of our generation I'm convinced and he says that weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity into a system which lacks diversity and we see this all the time the, the, the less diverse anybody's rotation is, the more weeds and diseases they're going to have. And somebody that's just corn, 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 or corn beans, you know, they're going to have weed issues, they're going to have insect issues, they're going to have disease issues because that system is lacking diversity. But we can add diversity on our own and we can negate a lot of the benefits of this uh, bad diversity with the weeds and the diseases and the insects. And again, we feel like the best way that we can do that or one of the easiest ways anyway is through cover crops because cover crops are the perfect opportunity to have this great diversity because when you are going to grow new things you oftentimes if, if, if I'm going to grow a new cash crop I may need specialized equipment specialized knowledge or a specialized market when I do a cover crop I don't need any of those I can plant these cover crops with just the grain drill that I already have 
I don't have to have a lot of specialized knowledge to know how to grow it because I'm not taking it out to harvest. And I don't have to have a market for it because I'm either going to be grazing it with livestock or letting the soil have it. So I want to just go through some of the scenarios where we use cover crops, where we're supplying cover crops for our customers. Uh, just real quickly give you some, uh, some background on this. So uh, spring cover crops, that's what the season that we're in right now. Uh, we're selling a lot of cover crops for forage production is the number one uh, use right now. That's the number one goal. You know, oats, barley, spring triticale, peas, faba beans, lentils, vetch, collars, basically any of the cool season plant species is what we're putting out there right now. And uh, one of the things that we've really seen this year that we have not really seen in the past is with, you know, 350 corn and 250 feeder cattle, and that goes up and down depending on the day, We've got a lot of acres that are being converted over from corn production to forage production, annual forage production. And this isn't just some marginal acres. I'm working with at least five different guys uh, and, and a total of 15 pivots. Uh, and this is 250 bushel corn production. And they're taking out of corn production and they're going to grow forages because they're convinced that they can make more money grazing livestock on those acres than they can in growing irrigated corn. And I think they're right. We've run some of the numbers. I don't expect you to, to see all of these numbers. That's a lot of numbers. But this is basically just a table uh, that we put together to plan out a grazing system uh, for, for our customers. And, and the, just this example right here, he's got a 52-acre pivot and 50 acres of dry land. And by timing this out, and this is in western Kansas, by timing this out, we're we're projecting that he can get over 70,000 pounds of gain on feeder cattle on this 100 acres. 70,000 pounds of gain at 250 a pound on 100 acres in western Kansas, you know, there's no way that he's going to do that with corn. So we got a lot of guys taking a look at this. It's a great system uh, for several reasons. Number one, a lot of these acres have been corn forever, and so the diversity that's getting added back in uh, because now we can plant you know, all sorts of things in here. We'll plant a cool season mix. They're going to graze that off. We're going to come right back with a warm season mix. So this ground now, instead of just seeing monoculture corn, it's probably going to see at least 20 different species growing out there just during this one grazing, se grazing season. It'll get grazed three or four times. And with the intensive grazing systems that we're recommending that most of these guys use, the manure is going to be incorporated so thoroughly into this uh, after they graze it, uh, that, that you're, there's not going to be any manure to manage. And, and, and it's a great way to handle manure because it's being incorporated right into the soil, right where it belongs. And so that, that's kind of a phenomenon that we're seeing this year. We think it'll continue as long as cattle prices stay high and uh, corn prices kind of stay where they're at. Uh, probably the number one use of cover crops in our area anyway in the Midwest is after wheat harvest because it's the longest fallow period that we have. You know, we'll, in Kansas and Nebraska and surrounding states, we'll harvest wheat in June and July, and then we won't plant corn until April or May. That's a 10-month period where nothing is growing, and, and that's, that's a hugely long fallow period, and we're wasting so much sunlight and so much potential. So this is where we see cover crops have just such a tremendous fit in these long fallow periods. There's a tremendous amount of things we can plant, both cool season and warm season things. We can have an awesome amount of diversity. It's tremendous grazing potential on this. You know, and we're mixing cool and warm season things together. And depending on the goal of what the producer wants to accomplish is what we'll recommend. If they want grazing, if they want nitrogen production, if they want to cycle nutrients, if they want erosion prevention, if they want to break compaction, it'll be slightly different mixes for whatever they want to accomplish. But this is, this is kind of the goal of what we want to get to, kind of this rainforest effect where we've got plants at different canopy levels, we've got roots at different rooting depths. I've got some things that are blooming, I've got some things that have died with the first frost, I've got things that will grow till Christmas time. It's such a wide diversity out there. And I've got a tremendous diversity of insects as well. And then probably between a half and two-thirds of all the cover crops that we sell uh, will get grazed by animals. And some will get grazed harder than others. This is just a picture one of my customers sent. Uh, but, but again, look at the cattle that have been through there. And there's no manure to manage because they have thoroughly incorporated that because of the, the stock density that they're using. Uh, the, the manure distribution is fantastic in that. 
just a couple of pictures, some economic data here. Uh, and this is, this is western Kansas, but this is dry land. This is last year in western Kansas, hot, dry western Kansas. He planted some warm season mixes, and he, he emailed me uh, just saying that he was so impressed with how much growth he's getting. Uh, and, and even some of the brassicas, the radishes, turnips, collards, cool season things, and he planted them in June and July. And, and he, uh, in fact, this next picture, the second planting, he says, eh, they maybe got a little too big. And that shouldn't be happening in western Kansas in the heat. But what we saw happening is these cool season plants are growing down underneath the canopy provided by the warm season plants. It's a different microclimate down there. And so these cool season plants are thriving. And uh, in western Kansas, he had a tremendous amount of growth. He put in almost 1,200 steers there throughout the month of August. And uh, without going into all this data, he was making uh, almost $600 an acre gross on grazing dry land in western Kansas. And he had very little inputs into this. He had a lot of manure out on these fields, so he had plenty of nutrients. But for 30 bucks worth of seed, one pass with the drill, a little bit of fence and some time, and he's making almost 600 bucks an acre. So tremendous potential, uh, not only on the dry land, but also on the irrigated acres as well. Then, of course, the fall planted cover crops. Uh, this is probably one that has a lot of potential because we have so many people in just strictly a corn-soybean rotation. It's the most difficult one to work with because there's just no time. We run out of time in this fall planted cover crops. And so we struggle with what we can do to try to make it work. Uh, these are just some pictures from our own farm uh, showing how uh, we're making these systems more resilient. Uh, this is corn that we planted into cover crop rye. This rye would have been planted after soybean harvest the previous October. Uh, the corn would have been planted into this in late April. And this picture was taken when the corn was about the three or four leaf stage. And uh, this particular spring was very, very windy. We had a lot of dust blowing around uh, from uh, our neighbors who had tilled or had bailed off the residue. We had nothing moving on this field. Uh, look at the protection those young corn plants had from my cover crop rye. This rye has been sprayed out, so it's dead. Uh, but look at the uh, look at the cover. Look at the uh, uh, you know the amount. Of, you know if, if I get a four or five inch rainfall, I am not worried about it here. I will infiltrate almost every drop of that with this kind of cover. And I can have you know a neighbor that's been no till for for 15, 20 years. And if he doesn't have the residue cover, he's going to lose the majority of a four-inch rainfall, an intense event. And, and again, we all know that the, these rainfall events are becoming more and more intense and less and less frequent. So the only way I can take advantage of that is I have to be able to take it in when it comes. And I don't know when it's coming, so I've got to be ready and I've got to be prepared. The other advantage of this is look at the amount of weed control I'm getting from my rye. Uh, back here is where I had cover crop rye. And the corn is coming up through that. Uh, look at the mare's tail that's coming up here where I drove wide and I skipped with my drill. All kinds of mare's tail coming up there. Mare's tail is one of the biggest weeds we fight. A lot of it's resistant to three different types of chemistries. Mare's tail will not grow up through cover crop rye. It just won't. It does not like it. It won't come up through that, but there's plenty of mare's tail seed in this field, and it's uh, not afraid to come up when there's no competition. One other thing that I wanted to talk about here uh, just as an example of, of some of the creative things that, that producers are doing. Uh, and this is something that we did this year, and we've got a number of customers doing it. Uh, and this is just stretching the diversity window out even further. But we're double cropping sunflowers with, with all these cover crops after we harvest wheat, after we harvest a cereal crop. So what we're doing is we're taking, and these are hybrid sunflowers that we're going to grow for cash harvest production. And so we're taking a black oil hybrid sunflower seed, and uh, on my irrigated, we did this both irrigated and dry land. On the irrigated, I planted 40 pounds of seed. Three and a half pounds of that was sunflowers. 36 and a half pounds of that was cover crops. So we planted it all together. We just went out there and we drilled the whole thing. Everything comes up together. Uh, one of the things that we want is we want as mon many things blooming out there as possible because one of the biggest pests in sunflowers uh, is uh, the head moth, and so we planted buckwheat, we planted sunflowers, we planted vetch, we planted all sorts of things that would bloom to try to attract the, our beneficial insects. And as the sunflowers grew, 
Uh, I had buckwheat and I had mustard and I had other things blooming out there. We had as many legumes as we could to try to produce nitrogen for this system. And we had a tremendous amount of plant diversity, but we also had a tremendous amount of insect diversity out there as well. Uh, beautiful fields. The, when the sunflowers, you know, they're going to be the tallest thing out there. So when you're looking at a field like this, you can't necessarily see everything in the understory. And we purposely keep uh, all of our cover crops short so they're not going to be a harvest issue. Uh, but it's all under there. And so here's a picture right prior to harvest. So sunflowers are almost ready to harvest. But look at the living ecosystem that I have down underneath this now. And I've got roots. I've got, I've got legume plants still producing nitrogen. I've got grazing potential now after I harvest my sunflowers, and I've already taken a crop off of this because these are the second crop of the year because you can plant sunflower. We planted sunflowers August 1st in Nebraska, and they made a crop. Now, we didn't harvest them until about the 1st of February because they were pretty wet. I don't recommend that, but you can plant sunflowers by the middle of July you know, uh, in Nebraska and be fine. And so they've got a wide window of application. We think things like this, thinking outside the box of, hey, what things can we grow in conjunction with each other, get a cash crop, uh, and also get, uh, get a, uh, another crop as well. Uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about, and uh, we'll see if this works or not, in, in talking about climate change and how, how we um, try to set our farms up. Let's see. I don't know. Did we get Internet working on this? Well, if you've not seen this video, I encourage you to go look at this. I'll just briefly describe what this is. This video is made by NASA. Uh, it's from 2006, and they model the carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. And this, this picture here, the red is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You can see this is from April 22nd. It's really cool because they have, they have a, a graphic from every day of the year, 365 days, and it's just in a big loop. And so it goes throughout the whole year, and you can see the carbon emissions in the atmosphere across the whole world, and in all this whole northern hemisphere, you know, in, in the winter months when plants aren't growing, there's a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide in the air. But as, as this plays, it's incredible because when plants are growing, you get into June, July, and August, there is almost no CO2 showing up. I mean, it's not like it's not there, but, but the levels have dropped so much that it looks like the southern hemisphere. And so... As I watch this, and I watch this several times a year, I'm thinking, what if we could take the wind, because there's 500 million acres of cropland in the United States. What if we could take 500 million acres and we could extend the period of time when we have living plants growing, taking CO2 out of the air, fixing carbon into the ground, into the soil where it needs to be. What if we could extend that for three or four weeks on the front end and three or four weeks on the back end? Because if you think about, you know, 500 million acres, the majority of those acres, corn and soybeans, they're only growing for about 100 days, 120 at the most. What if we could extend that window of when we've got plants actively growing and pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, fixing soil carbon, uh, what could that do, you know, to help mitigate some of these issues that we're facing? I don't have the answers to that, but I think it's pretty exciting to think about and I think the cover crops have the potential to, to really help do that and extend that period where we have plants growing and taking CO2 out of the air. So uh, I think we'll have the other people speak, and then we'll take questions at the end. So thank you, everyone.